Hey everyone. Whew, the PNW heatwave has made my computer room uninhabitable. <laughs> Luckily there is a supermarket nearby, so I went and observed some cabbages for a bit to stay cool. Uh, anyway, you're about to watch a version of this video that I considered almost complete. And then I got some phenomenal feedback, found a relevant research paper, rewrote 50% of the script over the course of the week, and I'm gonna record and release an updated version. So here's a sneak peek into my creative process. I'm excited for you to watch this one and then see how much it improves. The new script is... I I'm really excited about it. I'm gonna do a Breath of the Wild video in the meantime because I need to do something chill after all these rewrites. So, and I also, I need to finish reading this paper. <laughs> so please enjoy. Let me know what you think and stay cool out there. All right, video starting now. Episode one, in which we discuss the differences between foreshadowing, flash forwards, future shadowing, foreseeing, foe shadowing, rewatch bonus, Chekhov's gun, dreaming of things to come, once more with clarity, call forward, foregone conclusion, spoiler opening, dramatic irony. The Witness is a game that paints a picture of all-consuming obsession. Most of the game is spent solving these innocent little line puzzles. One after another after another. Drag a line from dot to end cap. And repeat. Drag. Repeat. Drag. Repeat. Players of the game have reported starting to notice these shapes in real life. On the street, around the house, in stores and art and television, and in other games. It was always there. It's not remarkable, it's a common shape. But now, you see it every time. You can't unsee it. This is happening to me all over again. But it's not a pattern of dots and lines this time. It's a pattern written in words, scattered throughout our greatest films and works of literature, and I'm just here, cataloging obsessively, don't mind me. And it's all the fault of Hank Green. Hank, your book exploded me. Yours was the book that got me to start noticing this literary pattern that I can not stop seeing. It's been three years, I have written 42 pages and 19,626 words on this subject, and I'm still writing. This book sent me on a years-long exploration of movies, games, books, stand-up comedy routines. I have sailed the vast seas of the internet looking for answers, and I have not been the same since. 19,626 words. And it all started with the first paragraph of the first page of a very good book. Look, I'm aware that you're here for an epic tale of intrigue and mystery and adventure and near death and actual death. But in order to get to that, unless you want to skip to chapter 13, I'm not your boss. You're going to have to deal with the fact that I, April May, in addition to being one of the most important things that has ever happened to the human race, am also a woman in her 20s who has made some mistakes. I am in the wonderful position of having you by the short hairs. I have the story, and so I get to tell it to you in the way that I want. This is the first paragraph of Hank Green's An Absolutely Remarkable Thing. It's the paragraph that spawned this manuscript. You've probably heard that every story should begin with a hook. In my opinion, a good hook should accomplish a few things. 1. Establish a strong narrative voice. I am in the wonderful position of having you by the short hairs. Check. 2. Set the mood. Reinforce genre and themes. Intrigue and mystery and adventure and near death and actual death. I'm also a woman in her 20s who has made some mistakes. Check. 3. Build intrigue. Get the reader excited for what's to come. One of the most important things that has ever happened to the human race. Check. So this is the um, textbookiest hook I have ever read. It does all of the things in the first two paragraphs, and it does them so much. 
It is so literal about its hookiness. And I'm not saying that as a criticism. This paragraph did its job. I was hooked. A plus. But the audacity of this hook wasn't what broke my brain. No, I exploded for whatever reason after reading this specific line. But in order to get to that, unless you want to skip to chapter 13, I'm not your boss. This seems like cheating. I'm used to the hook playing the role of a temptress. Hey you, look over here. Don't I look interesting? Don't you want to find out what's inside all of these pages? You don't just... Hey you! In chapter 6, there's a gunfight. Chapter 8, the aliens. Do you like aliens? No, 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 no. Surely an author is meant to hint rather than to state. A novel of good breeding does not parade itself about like a harlot. I am an artist. My book must speak in furtive glances. A hook is meant to flirt, not flash its drawers at the first pedestrian who passes by the Barnes and Noble? Well, first off, the first rule of art is that nothing's supposed to do anything. And secondly, you want to know what happened right after I read this book? Of course, I started noticing this same tactic. Literally everywhere. Literally everywhere. Like, here are the first two lines of Reincarnation Blues, the book I read right after an absolutely remarkable thing. This is a story about a wise man named Milo. It begins on the day he was eaten by a shark. There it is again. Hey, audience, here's exactly what happens later. Go, fetch. People are always asking me if I know Tyler Durden. I'm 42 years old. In less than a year, I'll be dead. I'd never given much thought to how I would die. Why are you the one who has to save the world? But dying in the place of someone I love seems like a good way to go. Attend the tale of Sweeney Todd. His skin was pale and his eye was odd. So, I know what you're thinking. Why is that incredibly handsome hedgehog being chased by a madman with a mustache from the Civil War? Well, to be honest, it feels like I've been running my whole life. You may be wondering what we're doing in a golf cart, fleeing from a creature of unimaginable There was a curse. Horror. There was a girl. And in the end, there was a grave. I never even saw it coming. What the hell is happening? I feel like I can see the code of the Matrix. And me, I'm the damn fool that shot him. It's like when you get a new car and then all of a sudden it feels like everyone in the world is driving the same car. Is that guy stealing my car? Ooh, wait, no, that's, that's my car. So what do all of these examples have in common? Foreshadowing, I can hear you saying. She's gonna tell me that foreshadowing exists. And I say, shush. It's much more complicated than that. 42 pages. I mean, you are right though. We do need to talk about foreshadowing. I never realized how vague the word foreshadowing was until I started compiling montages about it. I just took it for granted until this line randomly hit me in my weak point and I exploded. Why did I find this of all lines so arresting? Fourth wall breaks aren't new, not in books, not in movies, not in plays. But something about a character goading me to skip to the good part, which will happen exactly here. It opened something in my brain and since then I have just been absorbing. Foreshadowing is the broadest term I know that relates to a writer's decision to give their audience information about something before it happens in the story's sequential timeline. Foreshadowing basically means hinting at events that will come later in the story. And that's vague as fuck! What is hinting? What are events? Does it matter who's doing the hinting? Does it matter how or when the hinting is done? 
does it count as a hint to say, today this guy is gonna get eaten by a shark, and then boom, he does? Foreshadowing? But still, if foreshadowing is generally a light breeze carrying rain, this... But in order to get to that, unless you want to skip to chapter 13, I'm not your boss. Feels like getting hit in the face with a snowplow. This feels like a book asking politely if it can take me hostage. This feels like what a book would write on its Tinder profile. And yet, we're surrounded by stuff like this. Constantly bombarded by snowplows to the face. Almost every story I encounter has some hint of not just foreshadowing, but deliberately telling the audience what or where or who or when is going to happen later in the story. And I don't mean, Oh wow, a singing contest is coming to my hometown. I hope I can enter and win the prize. Like, yes, she's gonna enter. She's probably gonna win the prize. Hello, we've all seen movies. No, more like, Hi, my name's Vicky. Let me tell you about the time I won the singing contest and ritualistically sacrificed my entire family to do it. Freeze! I bet you're wondering how I got here. See, like, I make fun, but I would read that second story instantly. If anyone but the author tells us something like this, we call that a spoiler. And most of us hate those. The gift of the Hank Green book hook was not in doing something new, it was in being so explicit about what it was doing that I couldn't not start noticing this everywhere. Seriously, what is the opening number to Hamilton if not mystery, intrigue, near death, and actual death? We fought with him. Me, I died for him. Me, I trusted him. Me, I loved him. And me, I'm the damn fool that shot him. Once upon a time, I would have said this tactic of leading with your own hype feels cheap. Maybe it's because I grew up on the internet, and this is exactly how clickbait works. You won't believe what this child star looks like now. What happened next blew my mind. Area woman discovers cheap, easy skincare trick. Doctors hate her. Wait, don't go! Here's a thing you want to know so badly you didn't even know you wanted to know it until we brought it up. But now, you've just got to find out, right? It's so juicy. It's so worth it. Why don't you just skip to chapter 13? But clickbait didn't invent this, and neither did books, and neither did movies. This is just how we've all learned how to talk to each other. How to grab each other's attention in a world filled with humans with short attention spans. Look, think of how you might tell a simple story. Jenny went to the store to buy some Swiffer pads, but she forgot her credit card. So she stuffed the Swiffer pads into her bra, and now she's not allowed in the department store. But now, think of how you would start the same story if you were telling it to your friends at the bar. Did you hear how Jenny got banned from Target? And your friends go, oh my god, no, tell me what happened. I think some authors unintentionally structure their stories this way because they feel that it works. We all intuitively learn to lead a story with the promise of later payoff. And as audience members, when we know that a story is building to something exciting, we are way more likely to put in the work to get there. It's one of the ways that we gamble on how to spend our precious, limited attention. I mentioned this in a previous video, but I think this is even more important in the streaming age. When hundreds of thousands of books and comics and movies and shows and games and social media platforms are all competing for your attention, a story needs to prove quickly that it is worth your time. YouTubers know this well. I mean, just look at my analytics. Statistically, you are no longer watching this video. I have about 60 seconds to convince like 50% of my viewers to keep watching. Hence the beginning of this video you just watched. Starting a story with its own hype, or even going so far as to nearly spoil a few of the best parts right out of the gate, serves the same function as reviews on Goodreads, or recommendations from friends we trust, or quotes from respected authors on the front of a book. It's the closest the writer can get to saying, This will be good, I promise. Here's a little sample of the goodness. Here's my 10% down payment. Do you trust I'm good for the rest? Take a look at the Netflix series Raising Dion. It's coming, Dion. 
It's out there, and it's coming. And I don't know how to stop it. My sweet boy, why are you the one who has to save the world? This isn't the trailer. It's the first two minutes of the show. The people behind the show know that when someone's browsing Netflix and decides to check them out, they have minutes to convince them not to skip to the next item in the list. So, bam, lightning, bam, stakes, bam, conflict, please keep watching. This is what I talked about in my very first video on the foreshadowing in I Am Not Okay With This. I'm a little bit obsessed with this topic, can you tell? Black screen, fade in, bam, main character covered in blood. Please don't leave. The first 20 seconds is the Costco sampler. You let the audience know what they're in for in bite-sized format. Or you just summarize the entire story for the audience just in case. I seriously cannot get over the fact that Romeo and Juliet starts with this. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured, piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. It just tells you the play. It tells you the play. It tells you why. I love this why. Why is this happening? And is that foreshadowing? If foreshadowing can mean make it be raining so we know there's going to be a sad, then it feels wrong for foreshadowing to also mean this. <laughs> Back to the question of labels. Technically, we do have a specific word for scenes like this. They're called flash forwards. Has anyone pointed that out in the comments yet? I bet someone has. Go check, I don't want to. In layman's terms, flash forwards are these. The demolitions committee of Project Mayhem wrapped the foundation columns of a dozen buildings with blasting gelatin. In two minutes, primary charges will blow base charges and a few square blocks will be reduced to smoldering rubble. Look out! Uh, did that kind of feel like spoilers? It felt like spoilers, right? But those were the first scenes of all of those movies and shows. The writers wanted you to see that information ahead of time. I bet you're wondering how I- Why is that incredibly handsome- A flash forward is interruption of chronological sequence by interjection of events of future occurrence. Sometimes the scene is shown again in the exact same way, with the only difference being the audience's new understanding of what it meant. Sometimes the scene is extended or reshot from a different perspective to show the newly revealed meaning. Those definitions are from Merriam-Webster and TV Tropes two equally reputable sources. So this is a flash forward. You see, the body of a young man was found floating in the pool of her mind. And this isn't. I'm the damn fool. Is. Your diary. Isn't. It begins on the day he was eaten by. Is. Isn't. These aren't taking us to an upcoming moment. They're not showing us events out of order. They are telling us, in order, what is going to happen later. Sometimes with even greater specificity than a flash forward would. She will be the betrayer. So then, what are those other things? What's happening? What are words? Flash forwards, not to be conflated with... Dreaming of things to come, once more with clarity, or... Foreseeing my death. Necessarily. Y'all, I don't think you realize how many concepts there are related to this stuff. I spent the first year-ish of researching this video flashing through every concept I could find that relates to how a writer structures and distributes information throughout a story. Just look at the TV Tropes page for tropes related to Chekhov's gun. Also not to be confused with future shadowing, where the viewer sees the consequences of actions before seeing the actions themselves via time travel or future sight, or just via seeing the scenes out of chronological order. Is that different? Oops, I broke my book. No, it was an absolutely remarkable thing the whole time. I tricked you. 
All right, all right, all right. Technical definitions aside, you can see how these flash forwards, despite residing under a different label than the hook of an absolutely remarkable thing, can help a story fulfill the same three criteria. One, establish a strong narrative voice. Or in the case of visual media, you may want to establish your cinematic language, your color palette, the general vibe of your main character on screen. Or in the case of visual media that is also Deadpool, do all of it. Bang! Oh! Oh, hello. Two, set the mood, reinforce genre and themes. Three, build intrigue, get the audience excited for what is to come. For a while, I thought this was much more important for TV than it was for movies. Like, why start your Sonic movie with a flying car chase? Who are you trying to grab? <laughs> We're already in the theater. We've already rented the movie. You can stop selling. Do you think the previews put us to sleep? Wake up, Grandma, we gotta hear the hedgehog's backstory. But, you know, every story needs a hook. And a flash forward is a great option. It's obviously not your only option. You can think of plenty of examples of movies that lay out their style, genre, main character in chronological format. Where a flash forward can be helpful is when your movie is going to spend a lot of its setup time in a different location, style, genre, or tone. Flash forwards can help you signal to the audience, hey, this stuff, this stuff you're looking at, it's coming. It's in the movie, it's just later. Now let's go watch this sad girl at a sad orphanage. She'll play chess, don't even worry about it. Chess is coming, just not right now. In that way, flash forwards do accomplish a lot of the same things as foreshadowing does, and in the same-ish way. So I asked some of my friends whether or not they would consider flash forwards to be a type of foreshadowing. And some of them said, yeah, yeah, sure, why not? And some of them said, no, did no. definitely, no. of course, no, no. no. Ab absolutely no. not. No, that's not what that's that means. Not that's not what, what that, that means. means. <sighs> I'm just asking. Makes sense to me. All of you foreshadowing purists do have a point. Like, right, in the definition of foreshadowing, the word hinting is pretty pivotal. Hinting, not screaming. Like, okay, right here, in this article from Masterclass. In the definition of foreshadowing, the word hint is key. Foreshadowing does not necessarily mean explicitly revealing what will happen later in your story. Necessarily. NECESSARILY! Is this foreshadowing? Is this foreshadowing? Am I for- <sighs> I got into literary analysis as a survival mechanism. As a writer, I want to create the most engaging, fulfilling stories that I can. And that involves looking at stories I admire and finding patterns and tropes that can give me a better understanding of what makes stories work. I'm gonna level with you. This script was hard for me to write because I just couldn't get over my inability to present a definitive set of labels to describe the things that I was watching and reading. I found that my fixation on labels was not necessarily missing the point, but certainly not getting all the way to the point. That's not to say labeling isn't a useful practice. In fact, trying to come up with labels, this helped me articulate to myself the differences between story devices that, on their surface, appeared to be doing the same thing. In trying to find patterns, I had been relying on labels as an end goal, to prove a point, to win an argument with myself. Like literary analysis is a problem with one answer, or something incomplete to be pieced together. And then in the end, you're... what? You're done? You have your scrapbook of labels and you can just move on to the next thing? Storytelling is not a puzzle to be solved. Now, in 2021, in the umpteenth draft of this never-ending script, I've grown a lot as a storyteller from having interrogated these labels. Just as long as we don't spend all of our time obsessing over the labels themselves rather than the concepts they're supposed to help us understand. So, what do all of these examples have in common? Information, 
information given to you, the audience, to change your experience now and to change your experience later by building a bridge in the story from present to future. A story is just information told in an order, and you can change the order however you like, using a million different techniques with a million different names. Information can be given, withheld, revised, expanded, misdirected, teased. What happens in chapter 13, Hank? He didn't even give that much information here. He just said, here's my Costco sampler. And I said, yep, that sounds exactly like the kind of story I want in my life right now. And it was. It doesn't always work out that way. I'm not always happy I bit the hook. And I'm sure there are a lot of stories whose hooks I passed on, but which would have been great for me. Thankfully, that's where everyone else comes in. Thank goodness we have all these video essays telling me to go watch Booksmart and play Disco Elysium. In the end, labels are like setting up an outpost in unfamiliar territory, drawing a map of a space so we can go on to build our understanding further and further and deeper. Because storytelling isn't a puzzle you can solve, but it is a skill you can improve by examining how it works. And it's kind of fun while you're doing it. So at the risk of learning nothing, I'd like to present you with my own label. Skip to chapter 13, why are you the one who has to save the world? It begins on the day he was eaten by his shark. I'm the damn fool that shot him. She will be the betrayer. I'm gonna be referring to all of these as foretelling. That may feel helpful to you, it may not. Your literary analysis toolbox is stocked with what ultimately feels salient and useful and valuable to you. And if you're interested in splitting hairs, you know where to go. Make TV tropes longer. Do it. I dare you. Here's my definition of foretelling. Presenting to the audience specific information about the nature or time frame of a story event to get the audience invested in the promised payoff without needing to wait for the story to naturally arrive there. Forget hinting at later events. Let's broadcast them. Tell everyone how cool and exciting your story is going to be and make them excited to get there. Or even better, make them excited about the journey there. Always remember this part. The writers wanted you to have that information ahead of time. It's worthwhile to ask, why? Because that was always a choice that they made. I can't believe it took me until skip to chapter 13 to start thinking about this. Let's start with the end of the world, why don't we? Blue Sergeant had forgotten how many times she'd been told that she would kill her true love. He'd stop trying to bring her back. Eleanor ruining everything. Eleanor, gone. All this happened more or less. The war parts anyway are pretty much true. One guy I knew really was shot in Dresden for taking a teapot that wasn't his. You're Mora's daughter, Neve said. This is the year you'll fall in love. But this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends for the last time. My name is Jenny. Let me tell you the story of how I became the world's most notorious Swiffer criminal. I had never realized that there were so many ways to spoil your own story on purpose. We're not done. We still have 36 pages of script left. We're setting up outposts and venturing out into unfamiliar territory. Or more accurately, we'll be venturing out into familiar territory with a field guide and binoculars and a long way to go. In the meantime, let me know in the comments if there are any stories you notice using this technique. With any luck, I'll have you along with me obsessively tracing lines on the wall. <laughs> thank you so much for watching, and a huge thank you to my lovely patrons. We are double digits now, that is wild to me. Thank you so much to my new top tier patrons, Robin, Steve, and Shelly. Thanks so much to all who are new. I don't know how you all got here, but I am so glad that you are. So I will catch you in the next video.